Amen. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Behind your regrets and mistakes Come today, there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy From the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling Come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior is in
this day gathered in your name calling out to you your glory like a fire awakening desire we burn our hearts with you you're the reason we're here you're the reason we're singing open up the heavens we want to see you open up the floodgates almighty river flowing from your heart filling every part of our Place, your glory on our face, we're looking to the sky, descending like a cloud, you're standing with us now, Lord, fill our eyes, you're the reason we're here, you're the reason we're singing, open up the heavens. We want to see you open up the floodgates of mighty river. Good morning, everyone. My name is Brady Witten, and it's my privilege to welcome you to worship here at First United Methodist Church in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. On behalf of our congregation, I welcome you to this time of worship. Thank you for spending your Sunday morning with us. During worship, it's our hope. It's our prayer. That you will encounter God that you'll come to know Jesus through a verse, through a song, through a story, through a prayer, through a person, through a smile. It's time to praise. It's time to pray. It's time to worship. presence 
like a Jericho. And my walls are all crashing down. And right now, I know you're able. And my God, come through again. You can do all things. You can do all things, but hell, no, you never lost the battle. No, you never lost the battle. can do all things, you can do all things, but hell, no, you've never lost the battle, no, you've never lost the battle, and I know, and I know that you never will, you've never lost the battle, you've never lost the battle, you've never lost the battle. You never will sing that out. You've never lost the battle. You've never lost the battle. You've never lost the battle. Oh, you never will. You never will. You never lost the battle. You never lost the battle. You never lost the battle. Oh, you never will sing it out. You never lost the battle. the battle, no, you never will, you can do all things, oh, you can do all things, but hell, no, you've never lost a battle, no, you've never lost a battle, and I know, and I know that you never can do all things, you can do all things, but then, no, you never lost the battle, no, you never lost the battle, and I know, and I know that you never will, oh, and I know, and I know that you Thank you this morning, Lord, for fighting our battle for You can never lose. So I want to invite y'all before you take your seats to turn to one another and share the love and peace of Christ with your neighbors. And uh, those of you who are at home, I invite you to extend those greetings uh, in the comments, text message, however you want to do that today. So uh, when you came in, you should find a, an announcement card on your seat, and there was an, also an insert about a concert coming up, and I just want to draw your attention to those things, and I'm going to lift a couple of things up to you. Uh, as I do, I hope you'll find the attendance pads that are in each row. Um, and for those of you who are at home, you'll find links to the different things I'm going to talk about uh, in, the, in the comments on whichever platform you're on. And one of those things you'll find are, are the connect cards that we have here in these uh, red folders. So uh, we would ask you all to take a moment and fill out a connect card. Let us know that you're here. If you're visiting with us this morning, uh, I offer you an extra special welcome. We're really glad to have you. And if you in particular would fill one of those out and uh, let us know you're here, I'd, I'd appreciate that. And if you're here, you can tear these slips out and put them in the offering plates. 
when they come around in, in just a moment. So uh, second Sunday is Mission Sunday at First United Methodist Church. And if you're here, that's kind of our normal rhythm. So second Sunday of the month, we call it Mission Sunday. And during COVID, some of our mission stuff has kind of gone, gone on hiatus, but it's starting to come back. And I want to make sure you know about some of these things. So one of the things we do on Mission Sunday is uh, Judy Faust has our Cambodia craft sales tables set up. And those go to support our church's uh, ministry in Cambodia. And in particular, uh, they are hel helping some young people to make it through uh, high school and then college. And so it really makes a difference in those young people's lives uh, and in their families' lives. And so by, by buying those crafts, you can support that. And she set up just right outside this door and in our conference center. If you go out this door and kind of dog leg a little bit, you'll see it's in that corner room back there. Uh, there is also someone there selling uh, salsa that supports the Louisiana United Methodist Children's Home. Um, and, you know, it's, it's going to be like, you know, the summer is going to get here eventually, and you're going to need, like, salsa and stuff like that for your picnics and cookouts. So uh, buy your salsa here, and you support a, a great cause. Um, I also want to let you know that something we have not done really for the last two years is a ministry that we have called Revive 225. And we host groups that come to Baton Rouge. Uh, they stay here at our church. We feed them, and we uh, do an urban repair ministry. Uh, and they go out and work in homes in our community. So we do have, this is our first group coming since COVID hit. Uh, they'll be here. There's 26 young people and chaperones during their spring break from Oklahoma City, uh, St. Luke's United Methodist Church. And uh, they'll be working on three homes in our community. So just keep, keep those groups in your, in your prayers. Uh, another thing I want to make sure you know is that during the season of Lent, which is what we're in in the midst of the church right now, uh, on, on Wednesdays we have a 1210 chapel service, which is in the chapel, which is just right down that hallway. It's a beautiful service. Um, and also on Sunday evenings we're doing a time of gumbo fellowship and classes and you'll find more information about that in your insert here but I want to make sure you know if you didn't come last week come come this week so each week kind of can you kind of stand alone so come out at five o'clock for gumbo and fellowship and then our classes start uh, from 5 30 to, to 7 and then uh, please take note uh, that we're going to have the Baton Rouge Symphony uh, and they're really kind of like coming to a our organ will be accompanying the Baton Rouge Symphony next Sunday afternoon, so it should be fantastic. Uh, I hope you'll come and check that out as well. And with those things said, I'll invite our, our uh, volunteers to come as we take up our offering this morning. And as they come, I invite you to bow your heads with me in prayer. Let us pray. Lord God, you pour out blessing upon blessing, and you cover us with your grace. And we ask now that you accept these offerings that they may bring the blessing of your grace to all who needs it and give witness to your overwhelming love. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray.
swear I lay it down Every burden, every ground This is my surrender This is my surrender Here is where I lay it down Every lie and every doubt This is my surrender See, I will make and I will make room for you to do whatever you want to, whatever you want to. And I will make room for you to do whatever you want. our praise up this morning.
Today's reading comes from Luke 13, 31. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go and tell that fox for me, listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day, I must be on my way because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you, and I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. So I wanted to take uh, just a moment and thank those of you who have been praying for me. So if you follow, if you are friends with me on Facebook, which I spent too, too much time on Facebook, but if you're friends with me on Facebook, I posted this week that I flew up to uh, Washington, D.C. to visit with my brother, Butch. He's three years older than me, and Butch had open heart surgery two Fridays ago, and so he joins me and my dad in the zipper club, uh, but I went up to visit him for a few days, and I wanted to thank you all for the time to be able to do that. Um, he's doing well, sleeping a lot. Um, but I also want to encourage you, if, you have, if, if your people face something like that, stop what you're doing and go be with them. Uh, those, those things matter. So I just encourage you to do that, and I thank you for the time. So uh, I really am always amazed, no matter how many times I read Scripture, how new things kind of jump out at me. And I've, heard, I've read this Scripture about Jesus and Herod and Jerusalem countless times, but, but something jumped out at me, something really profound uh, jumped out at me this week uh, that I think we can learn something from. Uh, and it's something that is, uh, reveals something to us about the character and nature of God. I think all Scripture does that in some way. Uh, it is very good news for you and me, and it also uh, gives us a roadmap map for how we can live in this world, which I think, uh, to me, it seems like we are living through particularly difficult times, although what I'm realizing is most of human history has been particularly difficult times. But uh, So again, good news for you and me and offers us a little bit of a roadmap. So let, let's see what happens here. So uh, what we're encountering here in this, uh, this chapter of Luke is that Jesus is clearly on his way towards Jerusalem, okay? And we actually read in Luke 13:22 it says this Jesus went through one town and village after another teaching as he made his way towards Jerusalem uh, and really, in the season of Lent, we are kind of journeying with Jesus towards Jerusalem. And if you don't know the whole story, Jesus, in, when Jesus arrives in Jerusalem, this is where he has this kind of final confrontation with the religious authorities. He's turned over to the Romans. Uh, he's crucified. Uh, he dies, and then he, he rises uh, from the dead. And so our eyes are kind of set in that direction now. Uh, and as Jesus nears Jerusalem, some Pharisees come to him and basically said, look, you need to get out of here. King Herod is going to kill you. Um, and this was a serious threat. Herod was a bad guy. Uh, in order to consolidate his power, we know historically that Herod killed his own brother. We also know from the New Testament story that Herod kills John the Baptist. And so if somebody comes to you and says, this guy's after you, it's serious, it's serious stuff. But Jesus, again, he has his eyes set on Jerusalem, and he basically tells these Pharisees who are warning him, uh, look, I got to do what I got to do. Jerusalem is my destination, and I'm, and I'm kind of headed that way. Uh, and he makes it clear that we know uh, what's going to happen in Jerusalem, or he knows. And this is what he says. He says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. So Jesus is fully aware of what's going to happen. And yet again, where is he headed? Jerusalem. That, that's where he's got to go, right? Um, now, knowing this about Jerusalem, knowing that this is the place where he's going to go to die, what would you expect Jesus' attitude about this city and about its people to be? What kind of an attitude would you have about a city that was going to kill you or hurt you or, or harm you? And what kind of an attitude would you have about its, its people? So uh, for the past few weeks, 
we've all watched in horror as uh, Russia has invaded the, the Ukraine. And, uh, you know, to me it was bad enough when they first crossed the border and I thought, oh, I think we all kind of went, oh no, right, a collective, oh no. When, he's, when they started bombarding civilian areas, and this week we saw the pictures of the Russians bombing a, uh, a maternity hospital. I mean, I gotta just tell you, like, my heart broke, but it also is, has made me a little angry. I'm kind of angry. And I got to tell you, I'm, I'm a pretty, like, mild-mannered person by nature. I will tell you that I am a pacifist at heart. I really just wish everybody would get along. Don't you? I mean, I really, I really wish we could, let's just be at peace with one another. Uh, but as I've watched Putin do this to the Ukraine, there is a part of me, again, that's gotten angry and that wants the U.S. to go in there and take him out. Like, that part of me has kind of risen up, right? Um, and so, again, if I was Jesus, <laughs> and I was looking at Jerusalem, and I was looking at the people in Jerusalem, and I knew what they were about to do to me, and I knew I would want to call down a little fire from heaven upon them. I'm just going to be, I'm going to be honest with you. I got that part of myself, right? Y'all with me? Right? But here's the thing. That is not how Jesus responds. And he always blows me away with this. So, uh, this is what Jesus says. So he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. I'm going to go there and you're going to kill me. This is what he says. How often I have desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings. What? Not what I was expecting. Not what I would do, right? Now, there are a lot of different ways uh, to picture Jesus, right? There are a lot of ways that we can imagine who God is. And the scripture gives us lots of images. Uh, we can imagine God as a shepherd with a staff caring for his people. That's a biblical image. Uh, we can imagine uh, Jesus and God as a father running out to meet his prodigal son. We can imagine Jesus as, uh, and God as, as a servant. We can imagine him as a gatekeeper. We, I mean, there's all kinds of images. But how about this one? A hen, a mother hen who wants to gather her children under her wings. Is that an image you all have ever thought of for God? Well, this is one that Jesus gives us here, right? A mother hen whose wings are held wide open, ready and willing to receive and protect her children, to shelter them and to love them the best that she knows how. Now, there are all kinds of things I think that we can take away from Jesus' response in this moment. I want to kind of focus on two in particular. Uh, and the first thing is, what does this response tell us about the character of God? What does it tell us about the character of God? So uh, I got to attend a few LSU football games this last year. It was kind of towards the end when they finally started saying, okay, you can, like, if you're vaccinated, you can come into the stadium. And I, I took my boys and we went to a few games. And I, I love to watch LSU football. I love to watch LSU play. I got to be honest to tell you, what I really love about going to Tiger Stadium is the people watching. It's like my favorite, my favorite sport, right? Uh, and since they have started serving alcohol in Tiger Stadium, the people watching has gotten even more interesting. So uh, I did see a guy probably about five rows in front of me who was so inebriated he could barely walk to his seat. And I, and I noticed that, and I thought, poor guy. Uh, I watched another couple who were like going at it, like having a full-on argument and fight in Tiger Stadium sitting in their seats. And I remember thinking, ooh, this is not the place for that right? I, part of me wanted to go give him my card and go, okay, we can like sit down and talk, right? Um, I did watch lots of other people just having a good time and enjoying community and enjoying the football and, and being outdoors and all the, all the great stuff that goes along with this. But I found myself thinking as I kind of, I thought maybe, maybe part of it's because it's outdoors and I'm looking at this big crowd of people and I found myself thinking, I wonder what God thinks when he looks down on all this. What does God think about that guy? And what does God think about that couple? And what, what does God think about this whole thing? Interesting tidbit, by the way. Uh, the modern-day scholars believe that the city of Jerusalem had a population of about 100,000 people. Now, the, the, the kind of estimates vary, but that's kind of like good modern scholarship, about 100,000 people. You all know how many people Tiger Stadium now holds? 102,000, right? So it really is kind of like, and some people picture that when Jesus was looking out over Jerusalem, he was up on the Mount of Olives, which is just outside Jerusalem, kind of looking over the city. So can you picture him kind of looking at this crowd of people? What did Jesus think? What does God think when he looks down on humanity? What does God think when he looks at our brokenness? What does God think when he looks at our struggles? What does God think when he looks at us, all the mistakes that we make? What, what does God think? What do you all think? Well, I got to tell you, I think Jesus gives us an answer here. 
So we believe as Christians that Jesus is God in the flesh, right? It's always something I, I want to reiterate. I think it's a basic thing that we leave behind. We believe that in Jesus Christ, God, the creator of the universe, came in human form and walked among us, right? And so the way that Jesus responded to humanity is the way that who responds to humanity? God. So here's Jesus looking at this city, and he knows that they're about to do him wrong. And what does he say? I long to gather them under my wings the way that a mother hen gathers her chicks. It's this beautiful image of compassion and tenderheartedness. And i got to tell you that as I have come to know who God is and as I've read the scriptures more and I've understood who Jesus is more, that's the way I think that God looks at you and me with compassion and with tenderheartedness. And I think it's so important for us to understand that because I think too many of us think that when God looks down at us, when God looks down at Brady, that he's angry with me, that he wants to condemn me, that he wants to punish me, you know. But the God that Jesus reveals is not that. The God that Jesus reveals is a God of compassion and tenderheartedness, right? And in a lot of ways, that compassion and tenderheartedness is the foundation of the entire gospel story, right? Why did God come into human, human history in the first place? Because he looked at us and he saw our suffering and he saw our struggles and he says, I got to go, I got to act. God was driven by his compassion and his tenderheartedness towards people. Uh, John 3.16, which is a scripture I think a lot of people know, kind of outlines this when it says this. For God so what? Loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that he came into our midst, right, and gave himself for us. Uh, but listen, there is one thing here, I think, in this scripture that we really need to pay close attention to, and that is this. As much as God loves us, and it's a love that we, we can't fully comprehend, as much as God loves us, God can't make us accept that love. Well, i got to say it this way. God probably could make you accept it, <laughs> but God won't make you accept it. So this is what Jesus says. There's a little thing at the end here. He says, how often I have desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings. But did you catch these last five words? And you were not willing. You were not willing. So uh, interesting thing about a mother hen. When, when a mother hen is trying to protect her chicks, she doesn't run around trying to, find, to collect her, her chicks, right? Can you imagine parents running around trying to keep up with your children? Right? You know, it's like... Uh, and so what a mother hen does is she kind of like stakes out her territory and she sits there. And what, what do the chicks have to do? They have to come to mama and get under the wings. Now listen, there are other images in scripture about a God who seeks us out. So there's some truth to that too. But in this instance, we're, using, we're talking about an image where the chicks have to come to the mother if they want that protection and they want that safety, right? Um, and I would tell you that the same again is true with Jesus, Jesus can do all kinds of things, but he is not going to legislate love or force us to love him. Uh, in just a few weeks, we're going to talk about how Jesus uh, walks out of a tomb. But Jesus will not walk into your heart without your permission. And so I want to take a moment and just kind of pause here and, and check. Let's check here. Have you all invited Jesus? Have you all, like, you know, invited Jesus into your heart and into your life. Uh, have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and your Savior? I kind of think about it this way. Have you said yes to Jesus in whatever, whatever that means to you? Because I got to believe if, if we give Jesus an honest yes, that Jesus is going to start to do his thing, right? <laughs> and do you, and have you followed that yes where it is leading, right? Um, I just think it's something we have to ask ourselves. How are you living that yes out in your day-to-day -day life? If you say, yeah, I've said yes to Jesus. How are you living that out in your day-to-day -day life? And what fruit do you see that yes bearing in your life? Because again, Jesus, I, I think, is there. God's compassion is there. But God's not going to force himself upon us. We have, we have to be like willing participants in this thing. So uh, that brings me to the second thing that I think we can learn from this scripture, and that's this. Uh, the New Testament makes it clear that what we have received from God, we are to then extend to others. 
So if we have been the recipients of God's compassion and God's mercy and God's protection, then we are to extend that mercy, that compassion, that tenderheartedness to others. Uh, Paul says it this way in Ephesians 4. He says, put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander and with all malice and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. So do you see that little thing there? That as God has been tender-hearted and compassionate and kind to us, we are to be that way towards others. Now, I am convinced and I, I, I challenge the early service. I'm convinced of this. And if somebody wants to argue with me about this, let's have coffee because I like these kind of debates. But I am convinced that the primary reason that people hurt one another is because they themselves are hurt and afraid. I'm convinced of that. The primary reason that people hurt one another is because they themselves are hurt and they themselves are afraid. Now, do you want to know how I know that? because it's been true in my life. Uh, the, there, were, there have been times in my life, there was a long stretch of time in my life where I was hurt and I was angry and I was afraid and I took it out on everybody <laughs> that, that was around me, everybody that I could. I'll never forget the time my, my stepmother, I was in my like mid-20s at this point in time and she was reflecting back on my late teens and my early 20s and she said to me, Brady, you were really hard on your mom and dad. And I remember thinking about it, probably one of the first times in my life, I didn't feel defensive about it. And I just said, you know what, I'm really sorry that I was not fully myself at that time. And I recognize that I hurt, I hurt a lot of people. It's an expression you've heard me say a hundred times probably, hurting people hurt people. It's just, it's just kind of the, the way of the world, right? So years ago, a spiritual mentor of mine asked me a, a question or kind of set up a scenario for me that I always keep in my mind. But he asked me, he says, have you ever had a dog that you really loved? So have you all ever had a dog that you really loved? So I think this could apply to cats too. I have, I have a cat. I love my cat. But it's kind of a dog story. Anyway, so if you can think of a dog that you really, really loved. Do you all know that Jim Comer is like an animal rescue kind of guy? Jim, have you ever had a dog that you really loved? You have. Okay. So if you went out in your backyard and uh, your dog had gotten its foot caught in a trap, and your dog was really hurt, and your dog was really afraid, and you went up to the dog, and you tried to, like, put a hand out to the dog to help the dog, and the dog bit you, okay, got the situation? Would you be angry at your dog? Would you, would you blame your dog? What do you all think? No, why not? Because your dog is hurt and your dog is afraid. That's why the dog bit you. And what I'm telling you is when the people in, the wor in this world hurt each other, it's because they too are hurt and they are afraid. Now, I do want to say this. That doesn't mean you stick your hand back out to get bit again. That would just be foolish. But the emotional content is very different when you recognize, hey, this, this is a hurt person. This is an afraid person. That's why they're acting this way. And, it, and it, to me, it creates a little compassion, gives me a little distance. And I will tell you this, when I have responded from that place of compassion and tenderheartedness towards people, it always goes better. Always goes better when I can kind of keep that, that distance from people. So Proverbs 15.1 says this, A soft word turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Right? And so, again, there's, a, there's, this, there's this great sense uh, that I think Jesus has this sense when he looks at us. Jesus sees people that are hurt. Jesus sees people that are afraid. And his response is to have compassion on us. But we're called to act the same way and to be the same way in the world. So I do want to offer a couple of caveats about that. I have to. So first of all, I'm not saying that you should allow someone to hurt you or abuse you. I just, I, I can't, I want to be careful to say that, right? Like I said, you don't stick your hand back out and get bit again by hurt and hurt, hurting and afraid people. Sometimes healthy boundaries are the most loving thing that we can do for somebody else. Sometimes they're the most loving thing that we can do for ourselves. Uh, what I am trying to say here is that you and I have to guard our hearts. We have to guard our hearts. Um, we live in a world that can be very hard-hearted. And it's our job as disciples of Jesus Christ to make sure that that doesn't happen to our hearts. We're supposed to be the different ones around here, right? Uh, the other thing I want to say is this. Being compassionate 
and being tender-hearted does not mean we don't stand up or act in the face of injustice. We're not we're like passive wet noodles in the world, right? Uh, we can act and we should act as Christians in the world, but we must always act in love. We, all, we have to come from this place of compassion and tender-heartedness. So uh, I mentioned this, the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine, and I've been thinking about this a lot, right? What is a loving Christian response to what is happening in the Ukraine right now? How do we do this, right? Uh, and I, I'm going to come right out and say it. I do not have an easy answer for that. And there are really smart Christian people who have struggled with this question for lots of years. How do Christians respond in the face of this kind of stuff in the world? So I think one of the obvious things we can do is we can pray, right? Um, so we can pray for the people of Ukraine. We can pray for their courage. We can pray for their protection. Some have suggested we should pray for Vladimir Putin. You know, pray for a change of heart. Pray that God will intervene. And those things do happen. But i got to tell you, it did remind me of an Irish prayer that I heard one time when I heard we should pray for Putin. This is the Irish prayer. May those who love us, love us. And those who don't love us, may God turn their hearts. And if he doesn't turn their hearts, may he turn their ankles so that we'll know them by their limping. Don't you think that's a good prayer? <laughs> it's tough, right? Okay, so, I mean, we can pray. Uh, we can also give money to support humanitarian causes. I think it's one of the biggest things we can do right now. So the United Methodist Committee on Relief, UMCOR, has taken up a special offering for Ukraine relief. I know UNICEF is involved in that. Uh, you know, you all, it's the age of Google. Go home and Google something. Find an organization that you like, that you want to be, I mean, that's something we can do, right? There are genuinely people who are in need, and, and we, can, we can help them in that way. Um, I also think we can write to our government representatives and we can encourage them to be involved, right? We are global citizens here, right? And I know we probably all have different opinions about what being involved means, but, you know, I, I do think, I don't see how we can look upon the suffering that's happening there and just kind of close our hearts off to it. So act in some way, shape, or form, right? Uh, but again, what I want to say is in all things, we must guard our hearts, right? So I don't know how many of you remember, this is a few years ago now when Osama bin Laden was killed. Uh, there was a lot of rejoicing that went on around that. And I'm going to tell you that I had, a, I had a moment too where I was like, oh good, we got him. And then something inside of me said, wait a minute, Brady, wait. This, this is a human being, it's a human life, right? Now, was it necessary that Osama bin Laden be taken out? Was it necessary? I might say yes, right? But... I will tell you this, as a Christian person, I don't believe that I should ever rejoice in the death of a human being. I just, I don't, right? And so, again, we kind of, we kind of have to check ourselves. You all realize we live in a world that is very hard-hearted, right? It's our job as Christian people to make sure our hearts don't become that way. And I think Jesus is showing us that in his response to Jerusalem and to the people of Jerusalem. So what is a loving Christian response uh, in a very, very broken and difficult world in which we live. It really is self-giving and self-sacrificing love. That's what a Christian response is. So I know uh, many of you will remember the story of the shooting at the Sandy Hook School in Newtown, Connecticut, back in 2012. Well, as horrible as that story was uh, and is, there were also some stories of real beauty that emerged. And they always do, right? These stories of beauty that emerge in the midst of tragedy. So there were teachers uh, who put themselves in harm way, harm's way, basically got between the gunman and the shooter in order to protect uh, the children. And there was one in particular. Her name was Vicki Soto. And uh, Vicki was remembered by her friends as someone who loved helping children to learn. Uh, her friends talked about her enthusiasm for life and what a great teacher she was. <laughs> they also remembered that she loved to watch the movie The Little Mermaid, even as an adult, like it was her favorite movie. Well, when that gunman came into her classroom, she got her children together in a closet, and then she stood between the gunman and uh, the children, and she was shot to death, and she died. She was 27 years old, right? Now, here's the thing we got to understand. Jesus shows us and tells us that that's what love looks like. That's what love looks like. Um, and here's the cool thing. Jesus reveals to us that that kind of love is what 
God looks like. And so we are called as Christian people, first of all, to take refuge under that kind of love, to believe that there's a God who loves us that deeply and in that way, right? To say yes to Jesus and that love. But then we are also called as his disciples to be people who bring that kingdom love. We pray it, right? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're to bring that kingdom love into the world. And I'm going to tell you this, it is a kingdom of compassion, it is a kingdom of tenderheartedness, and it is a kingdom of love. And it's your job and it's my job to go out in the world and make that a reality. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Will you pray with me? Lord, we're, I'm always amazed at Jesus about who he was, about the compassion and love that he had for a wayward humanity. And Lord, I just uh, ask that you would help each person here to see the depth of the love that you have for us. I pray that you would help each of us to seek refuge under the wings of that love, to say yes uh, to life with Jesus. And then, Lord, help us to live that love out in a world that can be so hard-hearted. Lord, help us to make sure that doesn't happen to our hearts. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. So uh, it is always a privilege, and it really is, to invite any of you who are looking for a church home to consider making uh, First United Methodist Church of Baton Rouge that church home. So as uh, Methodists, we believe that the Christian life really is, should be, must be lived out in the context of a community. We need each other in this journey of faith. And so uh, we have a gathering we call Believe and Belong, and in it we talk about what does it mean to believe in Jesus, what does it mean to belong to a community of faith in a way that transforms me, transforms you, transforms our community and our world. So uh, if you're looking for a church home, I'd love to invite you to be a part of that, and you'll uh, see some information about that on your screens. And also want to make sure you know we have a resource table in the back just to the, my right of those steps. There's some books on basic Christian teaching, uh, basics about the Bible, and also uh, basics about United Methodism, or just Methodism if you're, if you're interested in any of those. So I invite you to stand as we worship and sing one more song together.
So as you go from this place, you all know you're going out into a hurting world, uh, a world that is very broken. Remember how God sees that world. Remember how God sees you. Uh, wants to gather us up like a loving mother hen under her wings. The world can also be a very hard-hearted place. Make sure that doesn't happen to you. Go out and be a difference maker, bringing compassion, love, and tenderheartedness to a world that desperately needs it. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.